Good morning. Uh, my name is Marvin Stam, and uh, uh, that's all you need to know. <laughs> <clears throat> what I'd like to do uh, today is I would like to talk about the things that you are interested in, the things that you would like to talk about. So this means that, whatever, that for the most part, whatever we do today hinges on you thinking about the things that you would like to bring up and you actually asking questions. So group participation is, is much appreciated. I'm also gonna ask you if you'll stand up to ask your question because this room, I was in here yesterday for Randy's uh, uh, master class, and it's kind of hard if you're in the back of the room and you're over here to hear clearly unless you stand up and, and you know, state your question loudly, shall we say. You know, like trumpet players do, we don't usually do anything too soft. Uh, let me just give you a, uh, for those of you who, there are a lot of young people who, uh, for them, I'm not in the same era of jazz that they are currently in. So uh, just to give you a, a quick precy of my resume, uh, I'm a native of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I'm a product of public school education uh, all the way through the University of North Texas. At the time, it was called North Texas State College uh, when I went to school there, which might give you a hint as to my age. But I graduated North Texas in 1961. <clears throat> uh, I did spend a, couple, a few years on the road, a couple of years with San Kenton's Orchestra and a year with Woody Herman. Uh, worked show bands out in Reno, Nevada, which was like a smaller Las Vegas at that time. And then moved to New York in 1966. And I was very fortunate uh, when I got to New York to uh, meet uh, one of the uh, finest lead trumpet players in New York, strictly by chance, the day I moved there. The gentleman's name was Ernie Royal. And for those of you who know a little bit of the history about the Miles Davis, Gil Evans recordings and uh, Bobby Brookmeyer and Manny Album, the writers of that time, uh, Ernie Royal and Bernie Glow were the two premier first trumpet players in New York City. And it just so happened that on this afternoon, uh, Ernie was not working, he was in between dates and we spent a couple of hours talking. And just to give you an idea, people used to say New York is a very cold city. And yet here was this man, one of the busiest trumpet players in New York, taking a couple hours to sit and talk to some newcomer who, who just arrived in New York City a couple hours earlier. And I always found New York to be that way and the musical community in New York to be that way. So I was uh, very fortunate to get involved in the jazz and the recording studio scene almost immediately. And, uh, and I must say that it was at the support of the trumpet community in New York City. Uh, within a week of the day I was in New York, I was asked to sub on the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, which was still quite new with its Village Vanguard uh, <clears throat> uh, Monday evenings. And at that time, a lot of the arrangers and composers and musicians would come down every Monday night to hear it because it was new, unique, and unlike New York now, everybody could afford to go into the Village Vanguard. And if you were a musician, you probably didn't have to pay any kind of admission charge. And of course, they knew everybody in the band except this funny looking young kid, you know, who nobody knew at all. The questions were asked and all of a sudden, the guys in the band and then other people that I had the opportunity to meet spread my name around. So I've, I heard Randy or someone talking the other day about networking. It's very important that you remember that your career as a musician depends on the people you meet and how you develop those friendships. So networking is a very, very important thing in your career. And that doesn't mean that you have to be on Facebook all the time or you have to have your phone in your hands all the time. Or like some musicians I know actually have their phone on the stand during rehearsals so they continue to email and text during rehearsals. Man, if that was my band, they'd be out of there so fast. I mean, either you're into the music or you're into something else. Oh, now I'm preaching already, aren't I? <laughs> anyway, I had, a very, I had a very successful career in New York. And I saw things change right around the uh, late 80s 
and I was asked to go on tour with a, a band of American and European musicians under the leadership of a gentleman from Switzerland named George Gruntz, who had a group that uh, toured a couple of times a year, two weeks each time uh, uh, in Europe, uh, the George Gruntz Concert Jazz Band and uh, some of the leading musicians in, in Europe as well as some of the finest players from the United States participated and playing that first two-week tour with that band which ended up being pretty much a 23-year uh, situation for my being involved with them made me realize that what I really wanted to do was go back to playing jazz again. I didn't want to continue being in commercial music because when I first went to New York we were doing a lot of jazz recording with some of the major people like Bill Evans and uh, uh, Quincy Jones and Oliver Nelson and these wonderful writers. And the business had kind of morphed over into like uh, radio and television commercials and rock and roll overdubs and things like that. And even then, as the synthesizers started coming in, seeing work kind of dwindled down, uh, I was looking for a way to get back to the thing that meant most to me, which was playing jazz. And so from about 1990, which is when I left the studio scene in New York, I started becoming a journeyman jazz musician. And basically that's what I've been up to this point. So that's pretty much my, my situation. As far as uh, teachers, uh, I, let me just say that uh, in Memphis during high school, I had, I had a wonderful uh, trumpet teacher in Memphis who was a commercial player who had studied in Boston. He not only played trumpet, he also played violin, and he also played piano. And uh, he worked with me a lot, both on a lot of classical literature. If you're interested, we can go into that later. And he also would work with me, teaching me jazz tunes. And he kind of got me involved in the commercial music scene in Memphis, playing with dance bands. And then I went to North Texas, where I studied with John Haney for four years. and. Uh, when I came to New York, I was a student of uh, Carmine Caruso's for about six and a half years. So that's pretty much, let's say, an overview. Uh, but from this point, let's, let's start to talk about the things that you'd like to talk about, things that you may find of interest. Uh, and if I don't know anything about it, I will try to think of someone that I can refer you to, because there's a lot of knowledge walking around this, uh, these hallways in, in here. So anyway, who would like to open it up? Don't be shy. Would you stand up and speak loudly so that they can hear you back there? Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you really, uh, what are some things that you think about or focus on as far as maintaining the health, you know, your health? You're a, you're a touring player, you're gonna play a lot of nights and, and you, know, you can't really afford to play poorly. So how do you, how do you approach uh, both your health as a, as a player and also just as a person to keep up with those things? So did you hear back there? The question is, is how do you keep up your health when you're as a touring musician? Uh, I, first of all, I'm very fortunate to be married to a woman who uh, for 44 years who was very much into uh, healthy eating. Uh, and and I, I worked with a lot of musicians who were very knowledgeable who said, only drink good whiskey and good wine. <laughs> Don't ever drink the bad stuff. Uh, I never was really into, into the drug scene. So, I mean, just to get, give you a baseline thing, moderation is the key as far as, uh, I think, uh, leading your basic life. But one of the things that has been truly, uh, to me, has been the key is uh, 47 years ago, last January, I discovered a book called Aerobics, written by a former military person, I think from the Army, named, uh, I don't know his first name, but his last name was Cooper, and it was the first book that I had ever seen about fitness. I think at the same time, the Canadian Air Force uh, exercises were out, but this book was about, this book was about movement. It was about walking, running, whatever you chose to do, swimming, anything that, that uh, uh, created an aerobic situation. So I've been running for 47 years. Well, let me, correct that. In the last few years I've been jogging. Uh, after a while your knees kind of dictate you go slower. But uh, I continue to do it almost every day. I couldn't do it this morning because uh, Randy and I had a nine o'clock rehearsal with the guys from the Falconers. 
But yesterday I was on the Cherry Creek Trail running. I typically run, I have a course at home. Uh, I live out in the country and, and there's a lot of hills and stuff. I have a course I typically run, but I have a, a running watch and I, I've come upon a new thing now uh, by a former Olympic runner that incorporates short, a short walk and a longer run. His name is uh, Jeff, if you're interested, Jeff Galloway, and you can look him up. You guys know about that. Okay, so I've got his watch with me. I take it everywhere. Keep it in my car when I'm at home. And, uh, and I run at home 4.7 miles a day. And when I'm out here, 10 cycles, which takes me 65 minutes. So I'm, I probably miss 30 to 35 days a year, according to travel or bad weather. But I, I know that people say you shouldn't run that much. You should do three days a week or every other day or whatever. It's a habit for me. And a friend of mine asked me the other day, he says, how do you do this? How do you get up to do this every day? I said, I don't even think about it. It's a part of my regimen. And I remember when I first got married, my wife would say occasionally, do you have to run today? And the answer was always yes. But I must have done something right because she's still with me. <laughs> Or no, let's say I'm still with her. <laughs> but that's, that's how I do it. But th that question is so very important, uh, first as, as a trumpet player, uh, but, but even more important as, as a person, because if you, if you really take the time to look in this country, if you, if you go anywhere, I mean, in, if you don't even get out of your hometown, but in every community in this country, you'll see people that at age 45 look like they're 65. They don't move, they don't do anything. They watch television, they, uh, and you would think that with all of the uh, information about nutrition and you know what fast foods and so on, and, and believe me, I understand the expense of this and that and so on and so forth, but there are, there are ways that you can have better eating habits and, and there are ways that you can exercise. If you only get out, 30 minutes a day and walk every day. Somewhere where you can just be away from your typical environment. I mean, you know, the phone ringing. Don't take your, don't take your, your iPhone with you. Don't put on headphones. Go out and walk and just listen. You know, John Cage wrote a piece of music that was 13 minutes and so many seconds of silence. But it wasn't silent, because when you sat there, the music was coming from everywhere. It might be in, in an old concert hall, creaky boards. It might be a bus going by. It might be a bird singing. You know, I always thought, that's, that's the biggest BS I ever heard of. And then, and I, I took an, I was telling some of the guys this morning, I took an art course with my wife. I never knew anything about art, and it was art from 1945 to 1990, and it covered all the abstract expressionism and, and you know, Dada and all of, these, all of these things. And it turns out that John Cage, the composer, and he did write music, and he wrote some great music, but uh, he taught at, was it Black Mountain College somewhere? It might have been in New Hampshire or, or Massachusetts or somewhere. And he was part of this movement, of this whole art movement. I never knew anything about all that. But uh, they, were, they were very much into the true nature of things. So give yourself a treat. If you, you don't have to run like I do, uh, the greatest exercise I've always been told, and I, I tend to agree with it, is swimming. Because when you swim, you use all of the muscles of your body. And it's great aerobic stuff. But just give yourself an opportunity to go out and take a, what would be for you, whatever your pace is, a fairly brisk walk, but with nothing, let your mind go. If you're angry about something, let it just kind of work its way out. If you're frustrated, you, you won't believe how, how much it means to spend 30 minutes away from everything. And that's, you know, I'm going to be 78 years old in May. And in my mind, I'm still 35 years old. My chops may not be 35 years old. But in my mind, I'm 35 years old. And I think that's a very important, that's a very important question to ask. Well, Thank I, you. I, I was incredibly impressed with you know, I mean, it's, it's
it's amazing. You still play absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Another question? Oh, come on. You didn't come in here to ask me to give you a speech. I can. If you want to get into politics? <laughs> Yes, sir. So, uh, I got a question, something that... Uh, Would you kind of face this way so yeah, they... sure. So, something, <laughs> something I, I've struggled with the, my whole life playing trumpet. Um, so, I'll be playing a longer phrase, I get to the end of the phrase, and I'm like pushing the last little bit of air out and my muscles will tighten up. And when I go to breathe in, because my muscles are tight, I have a hard time, you know, getting the air in. And so, in, especially on phrases where there's not, you know, places to breathe, very long phrases. But sometimes I could do it effortlessly, and sometimes I get, I get stuck, if you will. And I was just wondering if you could give some advice on that. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question about the use of your air, exhausting your air at the end of a phrase, and then trying to uh, fill up quickly to go. Now, are you thinking more of written music or improvisational music? more written. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I find with, with a lot of players is, is when they start to practice a piece of music, one of the things that they don't do is to really look at the music and try to figure out musically where the phrases are. And if running into some very long uh, uh, phrases, <clears throat> and I take it you're talking about solo, pieces, or you're thinking section stuff. Uh, both, both. Okay. There's a... One of the things that, that I do uh, with my practice is I incorporate a lot of legato tongue. And I, I'll tell you where I'm going with this. <laughs> If you, if you work on your legato tongue and you take a piece of music and you're practicing, you should try to see where you can possibly, in the smallest place, grab a breath, even just enough to help you finish the phrase. But, I mean, what you're talking about is something I've never experienced where my muscles kind of seized up and I couldn't, you know, grab a breath, uh, particularly if this is as much as, as a quarter note or an eighth note rest, you know. It's not ideal, and it's probably pretty, it's, it's not great writing not for someone to think about that for a brass player, you know. But I think you have to, sometimes you have to, particularly if you're playing in an ensemble, you have to cheat. It's okay, not brain surgery, nobody's gonna die from it. And if you're playing, let's say, in a, in a, even in an orchestra, there are always ways to find some place that you can, you can grab something. As far as if this is a physical thing that happens a lot, uh, then that's something maybe you could talk to a, a physical therapist about. But if it's something that just happens occasionally when you're playing, then it's something that you need to just figure out places that you can solve that. And a lot of times we're afraid, you know, when something is written to go against the grain or to sneak here and there. Let me tell you something, the people standing up conducting or the leader of the band or even the lead trumpet player in the trumpet section, he or she are not going to notice if you grab a little breath here and there. So cheat if you need to. I mean, the idea is not to. And one of the things that I do try to do in my playing is I do try to always think of the phrase that, that I have to play and, and take in the air for that phrase. Uh, and if I see it's a particularly long phrase, but I, I do practice exercises where, I mean, whatever it may be, scale or whatever, where I push myself make sure I take in air and I push myself to use it as efficiently as possible and even to go longer. Like for instance, a ballad.
and I'm not thinking physically of anything particular uh, as far as taking a breath, but, but, and I'm not even, I mean, that was just made up. I don't know, I, that's not a song. I just made that up. Uh, but I do like to play long phrases. And I like to feel that when I'm playing that I can connect things. Now, when I do play a tune that, let's say, uh, are you all familiar with Hoagy Carmichael's Stardust? Just to say. Which, by the way, is one of the great interval exercises for any trumpet player. Now, normally you would take a breath there, right? But I try to go on. try to connect the phrases, I don't necessarily have to play four bar phrases all the time, you know. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, so if I were you, one of the things I would think about doing is to take any of your, and it doesn't have to be a, a song, but maybe concone exercises, <clears throat> and try to play instead of the typical breath marks that are marked, see how long you can actually play a phrase and connect them to make that very song-like, you know. And, and another thing you can do, just to give uh, you connecting my head, Charlie A2. Uh, I, I, I never practice Charlie A2 in a tempo, you know. I mean, I hear people playing, excuse me, I'm still a little swollen from last night. There's no music there. But if you think, and this is true of a lot of the Charlier exercises in Boza, uh, the 16 etudes, etudes and so on. Make it a soliloquy, you know? Make a song out of it. And I think a lot of times when we, when we do our, our practice of etudes and so on, we tend to want to stick to everything has to be so exact. Now maybe if our teachers <coughs> expect that, that's okay. But at the same time, a lot of times teachers don't encourage the students to explore the music in a piece. And that's, that's why, I mean, one of the reasons I always love to to hear Mark Gould play, for instance, who was with the Metropolitan Orchestra for 25 or 30 years and taught at Juilliard in Manhattan, is he's one of the most lyrical, classical musicians I ever heard. And always everything is, is, is music from him. Ronnie Rahm is one of the greatest B-flat trumpet, classical B-flat trumpet players I ever heard, you know. And when you hear them play, have any of you ever heard the, when he was with the Canadian Brass, Ronnie Rahm played the air on a G string? I, I went to hear them play, my wife and I went to hear them play at a concert venue near where we live. I live about 50 miles outside of New York and there's a marvelous venue called Caramore. It's on a, used to be a large estate. They made it a big concert venue that has three or four different uh, stage areas to play. And, and they played that and I sat there and, and I couldn't believe the tears that were coming down my cheeks. I was so moved by the music that Ronnie Ronnie made out of this piece. And, and when I think about that, I think that's what music is about. You know, it's about moving people. 
And when you hear an artist that can do that, Doc Schutzer, another one who, to me, didn't play the trumpet. He just played music with that Russian heart and that Russian soul, you know. You know. Anyway, here I am preaching again. <laughs> I want you to know that if I get an 800 number and I appear on television and you see me on, uh, what is it, the uh, Christian Broadcasting Channel, even though I'm Jewish, I want you to send me a lot of money. Uh, but does that, yeah. you know, even, even if you're practicing, uh, another thing, uh, just quickly, just thinking about uh, one of the things that I do early in the morning, but you can do it on anything that he does is, is the, the Clark exercises. You know, play them very softly and see, see how, how long you can play. And it doesn't happen to be fast, but just to see of your stretching out the phrasing, you know, even on the... You know, and, and do it something like that. You don't have to do it on something that after you get through, you know, uh, three or four minutes of it, you feel like, oh my God, my chops are killing me, you know. But give it a lot of thought, you know. Someone else? I must be good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir? Do, do you mind a very basic technique question? I'm, I'm a beginner, a returning guy, even though I'm older, I'm just basically starting over again. Um, when you play very softly, and then when you start to add volume, if you think about it at this point, but what are your thoughts on what creates volume? Someone else I'm reading about says that when he plays louder, he opens the aperture to play loud. I don't know if you think about that, but what do you think makes a trumpet louder when you play louder? Does that make sense, the question? Yes, you're, the question about is, is, I mean, what do you think about when you, when you play louder? Is it a physical thing that you do? Open your aperture? Uh, or what? Uh, I I don't you know what I what I find and I uh, and I guess I really became aware of this during the years I was studying with Carmine Caruso is that you know there's in this area there's so many tiny muscles and so many things that need to be coordinated to make anything happen and uh, Randy alluded a little bit to this yesterday. Mr. Caruso said, uh, don't try to physically make changes to your, to your embouchure or to your physical setup when you're doing this. If you do it consciously, you don't realize, I mean, you, if you have the tiniest piece of something from eating, it's on the inside of your mouth and you touch it with your tongue, it feels quite large. And if you get it off and you look at it, maybe you can hardly see it. So everything in your mouth is magnified. <clears throat> and he said, let the action from what you're trying to do determine what happens physically. In other words, if I'm going to play I know what I want to do, so when I practice it, if that's what I want to do is to crescendo my volume, when I practice it, listen to the sound, listen to the consistency of each note from one moving to the other. This is all listening, and, and try to produce what you know you want to do. But forget about trying to make physical changes, because if you do, you're going to end up in a lot more trouble. So, I mean, people talk, you know, people talk about uh, breathe from your embouchure, breathe from your diaphragm. But what is your diaphragm? Your diaphragm is an involuntary uh, muscle that separates your thoracic area from your abdominal area. And when they, what they're really saying is breathe deeply and when, you, when your lungs fill up with air, the other uh, organs and everything around it have to move. I mean, if you put a balloon in a, in, a, in a pail of water and you're able to blow air into it and blow it up, you'll see the water is going to be rising because 
that when you expand the balloon or you expand your lungs, you're displacing the other organs around it. So basically they're saying, breathe deeply. And you know, I think, I think uh, uh, sometimes things like that can be very misleading and they start to try to get us to do physical things that really we don't need to do. We need to just think about what it is we're trying to do. You know, now it takes time to, to do that. I mean, that sounds, make it, it may seem to you that what I just did then, which is a very simple diatonic scale, is easy to do. But if your body is not used to moving dynamics and so on, uh, you've got to, what practice does is let your body know what it is you want it to do. That's what practice is the, the uh, physical activity of doing something over and over and over until it becomes natural to you. So anything you're trying to do that's new, don't try to rush it. Don't go to the internet or to the books and try to figure out this is what they say and the words that they say are gonna make the things that you need to do by actual physical action change all that. Much of what happens with your aperture and so on is because you're asking your body to do something and it's naturally changing, whether it's opening your aperture or if you play higher or whatever, they say closing your aperture and so on. If you try to do it physically, you're all of a sudden going to be able to basically, if you're able to do it, do your, your body is going to respond to be able to do that one thing in that one small area. But if you forget about that and just try to practice it and and, and let the action that you're doing, in other words, is there, for every action, there's a reaction. When you want to do this, this is going to happen. That's just way, the way the body responds. But it happens differently for each one of us because every one of us in this room is a different person. I mean, no matter how minute it might be, and, in, and, in this, and, and being unable to see it, <laughs> I'll figure out the word later, uh, uh, we are all different and our bodies do respond in some minute. Otherwise, somebody could just have a system and everybody would play the same, you know? But uh, that, my feeling is, and, and here's one of the things, you as a beginner, or, or let's say a start up again player, or whether you're, whether you're a professional, one of the things that I've found that is very important in your practice is maintaining your sound in all the registers. And in other words, let there be a consistency of sound. So that, so that, I mean, you're, uh, in other words, instead of doing <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, there's no consistency of sound there. So whatever you play into whatever register you're practicing, Charles Colon, it's right in the first page of, of the book. Try when you practice to maintain the same intensity and the same sound, the quality of sound in all the registers of your horn. And, if, and it, it takes time to develop that, but when you do it, you're, you find that, that being able, trying to do that and being able to bring it about will add so much to your playing and cure a lot of problems that you may be experiencing. But start slowly, start simple, and, and take your time. You know, I've, I've been playing for, I have to figure this out, almost 66 years. 
and, and like Randy said yesterday, I'm still discovering things. And as, and, and as you go through whatever the ages are, particularly starting from late 40s into 50s, and then probably somewhere in the 60s going up, if you continue to play, your body changes. Sometimes your teeth change. So that is all gonna affect your, your playing. So, I mean, we're all still discovering the trumpet every day, you know? Someone else? Yes, sir. There's a, a lot of discussion about how, how much to play and how much to re recover and rest when you're developing your chops. Can you talk a little bit as you were developing the skills of uh, what your practice routine was in terms of building endurance and range? Uh, the question being, uh, building endurance and range and, and, and how resting works in that. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I've read a lot of the books and, and only recently have seemed to come upon the fact that resting is, is very important. So I'm not a very good example of, of that, of being organized with that. Uh, but it, but it is very important, and I wish I had learned that at a much younger age. As a matter of fact, that book that Randy was talking about yesterday about uh, Bill Adams, I intend to purchase it as soon as I get home because I'm very interested in, in all that. But to your, to your question, uh, let me just tell you what I do today as far as rest is concerned. Uh, typically, when I, when I do some uh, what I consider warm-up, which incorporates uh, a few sensitivity exercises. It doesn't make any difference what they are. They're just, they're very typically done softly and, and they incorporate just a little of movement of scales. Uh, some of the Carmine Caruso exercises that I've done, which are really focused around low F sharp, uh, and then some other things that Laurie Frink gave me uh, on some chromatic exercises, all very simple. You know, I mean, I don't want to go into what they are because there's no secret to it. And it really, everybody has to kind of discover their own thing. After I do that, I like to put the horn down for a while. Then I come back and I start to try to broach the more uh, strenuous things in, in, in my practice. So usually after I do that, I'll come back and just just play a few things. <laughs> just after laying off, just to play a few notes to, to get it back on, on the chops again. And then I'll start with an exercise that I do, developing range, using mostly uh, half note, half rest, and two on each note. Then from there, I'll try to go chromatically up to high E or high F. I'm not interested in going any higher. And some days, the E and the F just don't really seem to center. But I try to do that using the air and not putting, as I go up, putting pressure on my lips so that the pressure for is pretty much the same. Now, when you get above that, I start to feel that, that, that I'm using a little more pressure, but I still try to be aware of that. Now, you can take something like that and you can do it in any key. If you're trying to develop something from, let's say, your typical range is, is high C, you can start instead of on middle C, you can start on G, second line. And, and you can do four half notes, in, I mean, half note, half rest, half, you know, four of that instead of two like I did. 
Uh, you don't want to get to the point where you're really struggling with the horn to do that. Try to develop what you can up to the area that you can as effortlessly as possible. Now, I'm not talking about non-pressure and all that stuff. I'm talking about using your air and feeling that it's comfortable for you to play. That, that you don't feel like you're bruising yourself. After that, then I do a couple of scale exercises that involve me slur, a little slurring and tonguing. And then uh, there's an exercise that uh, John Haney had in, in his book, uh, high notes, low notes, and all the notes in between, which involve interval studies. And, and that takes me about three or four minutes. And then I like to put the horn down again. Excuse me. And then usually somewhere around that time, I will have, in between the first set of exercises and, and the next one, that's when I will have gone running. So after I do the, the second thing with the attack studies, it's time to take a shower. I'm going to get complaints from my wife. She doesn't, <laughs> she says, and use the right deodorant this time. So I'll go and grab a shower and maybe eat eat a little lunch. I'm not a breakfast eater, so I'll, I'll grab a little lunch. And then uh, when I have the opportunity, I'll come back and I'll start into a bunch of other things that will include some Caruso exercises and so on. So I try to incorporate that kind of rest. I know there's a, there's a, uh, a, there was a, a maxim for many, many years that when you play an exercise, you rest as long as it took to play that exercise, whether it was three measures long or one measure or 16 measures or whatever it might be. And, and you have to figure out what works for you from, from that standpoint. Uh, <clears throat> in, in, the, in terms of uh, endurance, uh, using the same kind of, let's say, format, you can figure out every day what you want to cover and what you feel uh, will, will be the most positive benefit to you. And, every, and, and that may be varying on certain days because as we all know, some days everything feels good, some days things feel okay, but as we play, they might get better or they might get worse. And some days you get up and it just doesn't feel good. So you have to figure out what is the most positive benefit to the things that according to the way you feel. But let's say, let's just take for example, your, your embouchure feels good. Uh, using the same kind of format in what you want to accomplish, whether it's working with Herbert L. Clark, whether it's working with Arvin, whether you're trying to do the Vizzuti exercises, whether you want to do Caruso or Bill Adams or whoever it might be, how it most benefits you is to what you can practice in this time span that, that takes you to the point that your embouchure feels good. Then maybe take a rest. Go do something for an hour or 45 minutes and then come back and do something else for whatever the time that it takes for your to where everything feels like it's really working, and then maybe take a rest again for whatever, uh, and 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 do that throughout your day. Now, if if you if I put my practice in to let's say three segments, which really incorporate approximately an hour and fifteen minutes to an hour and a half of my day actual playing time, if you want to build endurance, maybe you want to extend yours to two hours or two, hour, two and a half hours. Maybe you want to incorporate some etudes. Maybe you want to, whatever the studies are. I mean, you know, it's not about the studies. It's about how you organize how you want to practice. Now, you know, you can talk about endurance studies. And you, you can write a book of endurance studies and maybe not be able to get through the, you want some endurance studies, Top Tones for Trumpet by Smith. Sit down and, and, and start to play through that book. Let's say that the first, the first few weeks, you can, you can only you know, get from somewhere in the middle of that first etude to the end. But if you get to the point where you can comfortably play from the beginning to the end, then maybe take a two or three minute rest and start on the second one. 
you know, I, uh, I mean, it's, it's up to each one of us to figure out what we can do. But when your practice starts to feel like you're damaging yourself, you know, then you know that, that that's not, that's time to put the horn away. You don't want to get, you don't want to get to that point. So what I'm really saying is we all have to teach ourselves these things. The, the, the exercises we play, the books that we play out of, whatever our teachers give us, uh, it's all notes on the trumpet. We have to eventually learn to teach ourselves. We have to learn how to organize according to what our own bodies feel. Because the teacher can tell us what to do, but he, can't, he or she can't feel what we're feeling, nor can they do it for us. So somehow or another, we have to figure it out. They can only be a guide, and the books can only be a guide. A top line F in Charlie A is the same top line F in top tones for trumpeters. You know, you just gotta, they're just organized differently. So we have to, we have to figure that out. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of trying to figure it out. And I'm not, with, if you can do it with the guidance of a teacher, that's fine. But a good teacher will still tell you, this is what I think, this is maybe how I do it. You have to find your own way. Now, if mine can be a guide, when you get to the point that these aren't working or this doesn't work for you, eliminate that. Take the good out of what you can and then go on to something else and get some good out of something else that added to that original good works for you. And you have to, you have to go through. It's, it's like life. It's trial and error. Uh, I was so pleased to find that one of the greatest teachers that I ever came upon, who was more a colleague that I worked with a lot in New York, a gentleman by the name of Ray Crisara, who was principal trumpet in the Toscanini NBC Symphony after Harry Glantz, who was one of the uh, greatest uh, first trumpet players in the New York studios. He turned, down, he turned down the Metropolitan Opera, principal trumpet in the Metropolitan Opera, because he wanted to be a freelance classical player. He didn't want to play the same thing over and over. And he, in, uh, at age 58, went down to Austin, Texas and took over the brass department at the University of Texas and created a beautiful studio. And he was a magnificent teacher. And he said, Marvin, understand one thing, all teaching is trial and error. And when he said that, it was like, wow, isn't that something? You know, because a lot of teachers don't feel that way. It's my way or the highway. We're not built like that. Anyway, I hope that helps. I can't be specific because I'm not you and you're not me, you know. But if I can give you an idea of how to think this thing through for yourself, that's important. Okay? All right, come on. I'm, I must be boring you to death, but you're still sitting there. Where are those hands? Nobody wants to know how to play uh, giant steps? <laughs> I'd like to know how to play jazz steps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. A absolutely. Don't be shy. So yesterday, Randy spent a bunch of time talking about how he listened to records and started playing. And so I'm curious, your approach to jazz improvisation, how did you get started? What kind of things did you do? What did you listen to? How did, you know, were there any things that you did along the way that you felt, you know, were like epiphanies that really changed the way you played? Those types of things. Well, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Can you tell me how to play giant steps? <laughs> uh, in, in, a certain, in a certain way, oh, the, and the question being for those in the back of the room was, uh, how, did I, how did I learn to improvise? In a lot of ways, uh, it was very similar to Randy, to his, his way. He had his father, who was a piano player. I have a brother who is five and a half years older than me. And I can't tell you how or why, uh, but he became a jazz record collector. He loved jazz. And I think it was because uh, he had a, a radio. And in those days, uh, let's see, which would have been just at, probably the late 40s into the 50s, uh, on radio, you could hear broadcasts of bands playing from hotels and ballrooms all across the United States. 
I mean, you people never hear anything uh, rarely on the radio unless you have an NPR station. And then most NPR stations, they have certain focused jazz programs at certain times, usually at midnight to three in the morning or whatever. But you don't really hear the music on the mass media. In the 40s and the 50s, uh, I mean, when I was traveling with San Kenton in the 60s, every ballroom that we played, there was a radio broadcast from, from that ballroom. So the music was heard. That's probably where he heard it. Uh, my parents uh, that certainly were not musically inclined, no, nor was anybody else in my family as far as I know. But when I started uh, in the Memphis school system, when you got to the seventh grade, uh, elementary music was not offered in the school that I was in. But when you got to the seventh grade, you had to, either had to take instrumental music or sing in the chorus and take art. And at that time, I was rather a shy kid at age 12. And, and I never been able to draw well. And, and really, when I was eight years old, nine years old, I had a marvelous soprano voice. If I had lived in Rome and been part of the church, I might have been a, what do you call it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would have missed those three girls that we have. <laughs> oh, no. Couldn't have done that. Uh, but uh, my voice changed, so singing was definitely out for me. And, and I thought I could hide in the band. So I decided to take band. And the reason I chose trumpet was because my brother had a 45 recording of a trumpet player named Clyde McCoy. Uh, Clyde McCoy was a, a band leader. I think he and another band leader named Henry Bussey were two trumpet players who probably played in a lot of the bands around the time of Paul Whiteman, 20s and 30s. And they became band leaders who had dance bands that traveled all over the country and played in hotels. They weren't jazz people. They were just... Uh, uh, People for dancing. God, I, I think about my parents going dancing at one of the hotels in Memphis, and I bet none of you have parents that go dancing anymore. I mean, you young people. Anyway, Clyde McCoy had a record called The Sugar Blues. Anybody have a Harmon mute with a... No? Okay. Ah, hard to do. So he would do that with the, with the harmony with this whole song, and I thought that was really cool. So that's why I chose the trumpet. Uh, in the meantime, I had a really fine, in those days, it was junior high school, not middle school. So junior high school was 7, 8, and 9, and then Memphis High School was 10, 11, and 12. Uh, I had a very good junior high school band director who played the trumpet, and he started coaching me, and I made, I mean, I had no interest in, I didn't have any interest in really starting to play music other than it was a requirement. Uh, I started making progress very quickly and uh, it, was, it was just really all of a sudden great fun for me to do this thing. For a shy kid to find something that he could grab hold on to was, was you know, uh, an amazing gift. In the meantime, I'm hearing my brother play his records. He had a room, we had a, a, a small home, but there was an attic and half the attic, my dad had someone make a little room that was like my brother's bedroom so he could stay up there and study and have some space of his own. And my brother is a really nice guy and I started hearing these records, and, and as I got to play, and this is within my first year, probably around, I don't know, five, six months after I was playing, I asked him if I could come upstairs and listen to his records and try to play some of these things. Because I used to hear these things, and it made me want to just go get my horn. He said yes. Uh, so I started listening to his records, and I started trying to play along with them. Now, I had no trained ear. So it was terrible. But after I had done my other practice, this was kind of like my reward for my other classical practice, probably the Bellwin Band Book at that time and whatever the next step was up from there. 
And over a period of time, my ear was able to start to hear some of these things, and I was able to relate what I was hearing to the trumpet. And then I was able to start copying some simple solos. Now, I wasn't trying to copy Freddie Hubbard or Woody Shaw or someone like Wynton Marsalis or Dizzy or Miles. I was trying to copy some of the things that I heard from trumpet players from the 30s, uh, Roy Elridge, uh, Harry Sweets Edison, players like that, who, and, and saxophone players, people like uh, uh, Lester Young and Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins, people who when they played their solos, it wasn't about all kinds of notes and a lot of uh, using a lot of, let's say, atonal but sweet notes in the chord. They, they played more chordally. It was a lot easier to hear. So I started developing pretty quickly from that point on. And as time went on during these formative years of grades seven, eight, and nine, my ears were really starting to, to be trained. Now, I knew nothing about theory. Uh, by the time I finished the eighth grade, after playing for two years, I realized that, that I had not decided to be a musician, but music had chosen me. This was it. There was, and, and from that time on, there's never been any, any doubt about what I wanted to do. So then the progression of going from junior high school to high school in my area of the city, the next band was one of the top bands in the city. And my band director from junior high school knew very well the band director in high school. And he asked him when I was beginning in the ninth grade, could I come to their Monday night rehearsals and just play at the bottom of the section? Now, in those days, the band rehearsed five days a week. And in high school, they rehearsed five days a week. And this band director had Monday night rehearsals for two hours. Boy, I know most high school band directors I know now would say, oh, you're kidding. And the kids, they were required to do it. And if they didn't do it, you weren't in the band. That's the way it was. And the band was really excellent. And this band director said, yes, he can come on the Monday night rehearsals. I don't know what my junior high school band director said to convince him of that. But I came and I always sat at the bottom of the section and played along with the guys and could do pretty well. Of course, when we got to La Sforza del Destino, I was a little bit, you know, held back because that, that was a little bit beyond me. But I morphed from that junior high school in, right into this band, and it proved to be a really great working ground for me. And also the fact that I then started studying with this trumpet teacher who taught at a local music store. I think lessons were $6.00. Now this music store was one of the two music stores where every Saturday all the band directors used to come. They would hang out and talk about music, what they were doing, what it is, new music here, have you heard this, have you seen this score and so on. This was kind of the musical environment I grew up in. So here's what my teacher used to do. We would start off Arban, St. Jacob. There was a wonderful little book. We never worked out of the Clark Technical Studies, but there was a wonderful little book written for guitar, clarinet, trumpet, and whatever called Close 209 Finger and Tone Exercises. They were all middle register to not sometimes down to low G, but usually down to maybe A in the bottom of the staff. But they were all like one and two bar, later on maybe three measure exercises that you repeated six or seven times because they went to all of the awkward fingerings that you would do. Worked out of that. That was about the first 45 minutes of my lesson. The next 45 minutes was playing either the duets out of, out of the Saint Jacob, back of the St. Jacob book or the Amsden duet book. And this was not only training for technique and tone, but it was important to understand musical conception, and when the lines switched, who was the predominant and who was the subordinate voice? And when they switched again, that's how I learned to be a section player. 
So after that 45 minutes, we went down in the old days. I hate that phrase. In the old days, all the music stores had uh, maybe one or two piano rooms where you, you know, they taught piano students, but they didn't have acoustical tile in those days. So all the walls were papered with egg cartons. That was the acoustic tile at that time. We didn't use any music. He sat down and he taught me bebop tunes and standard tunes. And he would play and it would all be done by ear. And that's how I learned to improvise, playing with records, this, this gentleman, and this tremendous desire to, to, to play this instrument and make music. One of the things that, that I didn't do, which is the second biggest mistake of my life, was not learning the piano. That's where Randy and I separate. If I had only done that, I would, I would be so far ahead of where I am now. Also, I was never interested in arranging or composing. I should have done, gotten involved in that. I should have done more things that expanded my horizon. But there were two things at play here. One was I was so phenomenally interested in this instrument and what I could do with that, that that was my main instrument, my main thrust. The other thing was I was afraid of exposure like almost everyone, we're all afraid of other people knowing something about us. At this age, I don't care. There's not much to tell, you know. But when you're younger, and even, you know, there, most people are afraid to try new things or put themselves in a situation where someone knows, well, they really do this as well, but they really don't know what they're doing. I never really got into the theory of the music. Although, yeah, I read chord changes and all that kind of stuff, too. But Randy, Randy's an amazing. He can look at a chord change, and he, it, no matter how complex, and for the most part, he says he works that out and all that. Maybe he does. But from that point on, if he ever sees that kind of chord change with a raised fifth, a flat 13, and whatever other little weird things are around the, the letter of the chord change, he hears it. He hears it without having any accompaniment. He's, he's got some of the most amazing ears. Uh, and, and I find after I rehearsed the stuff that I was doing with him up there, I sat there for a half hour listening to him rehearse. I just love hearing him play, you know. But that's kind of how I developed my stuff. And uh, I would, I would the, there's several factors in learning to improvise that are very important. The first one, is hearing something, some piece of music, some solo, some something that impels you in the strongest way to run over and get your horn out of the case and try to play it. That's the very first step. The second step is in your inability to do it not letting that discourage you. Because everything we learn takes time. Then, hopefully, it will have been on some kind of recording, some kind of device or whatever that you, can, you have access to, and you can sit down and start to try to learn that. One of the things Randy was talking about, the two most important things are training your ear, to be able to hear and relate. What you hear, you can relate to your horn. Not that, you know, you hear something, somebody plays a chord on the piano, and, and, and you can pick up your horn, and you can play through whatever the, that chord is. You have to be able to, to develop that ability to do that. Uh, and I lost my train on what the second thing was. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, certainly, that's certainly the first thing. The second thing is you have to develop a vocabulary. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me put it to you this way. Let's, let's, let's use the analogy of verbal speech. How did you learn to talk? A little louder? By ear. Yeah, you learn by ear. 
I mean, if we could learn by being taught grammar, when you're in the crib, somebody could throw a dictionary in there and you would automatically be able to talk, right? So we learn by ear and I won't go through the whole thing, but by the time you're five years old, you're talking pretty well because you've developed this vocabulary. By the, you don't even learn grammar till you're in the third grade, at least when I was going to school, it was the third grade before we ever approached any of the principles of grammar, talking about a subject and a verb and a preposition, adverbs, adjectives, and so on and so forth. Uh, so how do we relate that to, to uh, learning to improvise? If you have, and you should have, some kind of recordings that uh, that make you feel that you want to pick up your horn and play that, then do it. Try to, try to learn it. Now, here's one of the things that, that I find that's tremendously important about doing that. If you can learn someone's solo, and you can learn to play it with the phrasing, the articulation, and the attitude of the person that you are copying from the record, you're learning the stylistic approach to playing the horn. You're probably not learning how, you're probably learning how they approach the melody. I'll give you an example of what not to do. There's a guy that I, that I said uh, one day came for a lesson to me and he said, uh, I said, who's your favorite jazz player? He said, Chet Baker. Any, are you familiar with Chet Baker's style of playing? I said, okay, play me a few bars of a ballad, you know, at least in, in how you hear playing. I said, that's Chet Baker, you know. I mean, there are a lot of people when they hear something, they're really not listening. So if you want to learn how to do this, the people that you are, that you are attracted to, whoever those play are, players are, Try to get into what they're really doing, stylistically, attitude-wise, the articulation, how they, how they uh, uh, make their notes sound, every portion of it. And if you're really listening and you want to do that, it's not difficult to do, you just have to pay attention. It's got to be more than just the notes. Uh, so so that's, that's all very, very important. And if you cont if usually if you find one thing you like, that's going to lead you to, wow, I really like that recording. Let me hear what else she like, what she's doing. You'll go to something else, and that recording will lead you to another recording of another player, or this or that. Don't always listen to just music of trumpet players. There's some marvelous saxophonists, and so now, if you're trying to copy Michael Brecker, good luck, <laughs> you know. But I mean, I find that in the beginning stages, to really develop this and to get the core of what the music is about, is go back to some of those players who were exponents from the Ellington band and, and the Basie band like Sweets Edison, uh, Clark Terry, and, and if you want to find out what a, what a technical wizard is, try to copy Clark Terry's solos, particularly that, that tonguing stuff that he does. He's amazing. But, you know, get into people that you can hear what they're doing. Now, I'm talking about in the beginning and, and as you begin to learn. Then, as you really get yourselves going, then you can go to the more complex players. But develop a vocabulary, you know, and this is all along with still trying to master the instrument, which, as Randy said yesterday, we still try to do day to day, every day. So, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really work. All of these things that we're asking of our body are things that, that if you kind of, uh, uh, compare it to, to physical things, you have to develop. Your ears don't automatically uh, hear a music thing and then put it to an instrument. You've got to be familiar enough with the instrument that the instrument, you, you don't have to figure out, well, let's see, I'm going to play a, an A, uh, I'm going to play an A second space, so that's one and two. It can't be that way. You've got to have some familiarity with your instrument, and then your ear has got to be able to hear that you relate it from this note to this note to your horn, and that's what comes out. So you have to develop this musculature in your, in your head, and then you have to develop a coordination. It takes time to copy someone and actually be able to play along with their solo. But all these things are tools that are... 
at, at least for most of the players that I know that, that swing and really play, in somewhere in there, it's all been about copying. And somewhere along the way, it's got to be more copying from, uh, from the ear than from the paper. Now, my feeling about transcribing is, first, transcribe it from your ear and whatever proponent the music is coming from to your ear to your horn. Then, if you really want to know what it's all about, then put it to paper and analyze it. But if you try to put it in paper first, and then, I mean, I've had people come up and say, look at this, can you play that? Absolutely not. Well, you did so on so-and-so recording, and Dizzy tells, used to tell stories like that. I couldn't play that, and, it, and it's true. A lot of things, you can go pick up all these transcription books of Clifford Brown solos and everything, but if you don't have his sound and how he articulates and his attitude toward the music and all that stuff in mind, all you're doing is playing another exercise book. It's all notes on the paper. That's not what you're going for. And that's the difference between a jazz musician and a classical musician. I ask sometimes when I'm doing a, a workshop <clears throat> and, and people mention about improvisation, now obviously a number of you are, are jazz proponents, but I'll ask some of the classical people, do you ever pick up your horn and just Just play, just play. Don't, don't play an etude, don't play an excerpt from anything, just play. And almost never does one say, yeah, I do that. Yeah, well, you're unusual. <laughs> and, and you know what, being unusual in this case is really good. As a matter of fact, being an unusual is good anyway because it makes for all kinds of people, right? But that's, that's much to your benefit to be able to do that. And you would think that somebody that had an instrument uh, like the trumpet, I mean, it's so simple to actually sit down in a quiet place, maybe outside in your backyard when it's dusk in the summertime or by a, if you know a place in a park by a stream or something, and take your horn and just play for a while. Play for you. No other reason, just for you. And, and, and make a melody. You don't have to prove, you know, this is one of the things about this instrument is to a certain extent, everybody at some stage feels like they gotta prove themselves. <clears throat> and that's usually not making music. It's usually showing somebody else so they'll accept us. And maybe we haven't accepted ourselves yet. Boy, that's pretty profound. <laughs> Don't ever forget I said that. <laughs> okay, so uh, any of you who have to leave or are in a hurry, please don't feel, you know, I'll stay as long as, as, as you want. But uh, uh, I, I find that, that the mystery of playing music and, and the actual thrill, but the, also the hardships and the heartbreak, because we all go through all of that, is what makes all of this so interesting. And continually, uh, uh, you just never stop learning. It's ceaseless. And that's one of the few things, except for maybe quantum physics, that is ceaseless in, in our workday lives. We are so lucky to have something like music. And you know, it usually brings us together for the better reasons of ourselves, as opposed to going to a football game. And I mean, you know, there are a lot of football fans that they want to see the head butts. They want to see these guys carried off the field. They don't care if, you know, at age 40, they're brain dead, you know. I mean, 
people are like that. What we come together for is something altogether different. And uh, I don't know. I think we should celebrate that. And that's what this is all about. This is, we're all lucky to be here in whatever capacity that we're, that we're here. So, so is there any other question? It, listen, nothing is insignificant. If you want to ask it, you got it halfway up? Okay. Yes. I just want to ask about... Um, Would you speak that way? Uh, do you have um, any books you like to read on the side that maybe not to do anything with trumpet, but like just other uh, meditative or mind things that you have seen before? Uh, do I have other things other than music related stuff that I, I enjoy? I, I love to read. Uh, I, uh, both my wife and I and my children are inveterate leaders. My children are all adults now, but, but uh, yes, uh, sometimes I like the mystery novels, particularly if you're flying on an airplane. I mean, there's nothing more boring than flying on an airplane and travel these days, which used to be something that people loved and adored, is a, I don't know anybody who likes to fly anymore. You don't get any kind of food, whatever you get is trash. Uh, you know, except for Southwest Airlines or maybe one or two other airlines, the people who work there feel demeaned working, working in these situations. So, so I try to get into something that really takes me away. But I also, I've been reading a number of things uh, I'll just give you a quick, not that this is terribly profound, but a lot of things about cooking, because I like to cook. And I'm, I'm a good cook. I'm not a great cook and I'm no chef, but I love reading the stories uh, that Ruth Reichel, who was a writer from the New York Times, a food critic, and used to write and stuff about her growing up in food. And there's a number of books about chefs that have been written by chefs that are really good. You can Google a number of them. Uh, uh, I love reading about musicians. I just finished reading a book that uh, my friend, uh, drummer, great jazz drummer named Dennis McCrell lent me about uh, John Levy, who started off as a bassist. I think he was born in the 1920s, started off as a bassist working in Chicago and eventually moved into artist management. And he managed some of the great people from, from my period of time, Nancy Wilson, the singer, uh, Joe Williams, the great singer from Basie's band, Cannonball Adderley and his group, all kinds of the uh, uh, Ahmad Jamal, uh, Ramsey Lewis, people like this. And that was a very interesting book to read. But I've been reading uh, various uh, things by, about, about a lot of other musicians. Uh, I've read some of the classical things, the book about Doc Schutzer, that was supposedly an autobiography, uh, Brian Shook's book, about Vacchiano. There's a wonderful book if you want to get a little taste of symphony life by a fellow, I, I want to say it's Vigilant, but it's, it's V-I-G something, and it's about the Boston Symphony, and it really uh, relates a lot to Char Charlie Schluter, who was the principal in Boston, principal trumpet for a number of years, and kind of the ongoing war he had with Seiji Ozawa. <laughs> Did you read the book? It's, uh, uh, and I can't remember the guy's last name, but it's either V-I-G-A-N-D or V-I-G-I-L-A-N-D, something like that. So I like all that kind of reading. Now, I also read some of the political stuff. Uh, I'm, I just, I never knew about this book. I just started it the other day and it, its impact, immediate impact is amazing. It's been around for a long time. It was written by a gentleman named Howard Zinn, Z-I-N-N, -N, who taught at Boston University and also at Spelman College in Atlanta, which is a black school. Uh, and he wrote, a, he wrote a book called People's History, uh, People's History of the United States. And this book is written not about the history that we learn, how great Columbus was, uh, uh, how great all the battles and the victories were. I mean, it go, he, every history in every chapter is written from the viewpoint of the people who were oppressed, 
and from their side of the story and what really happened, starting with Columbus and how the Spaniards, what they did to all of the native populations in South America, Central America, and the islands. And then, I mean, just give you a mahala. He goes into the Civil War, and he gives you all of that from the, uh, from the viewpoint of the slaves. And, and he goes on and on throughout the whole thing, the Japanese internment, World War II, things like that. So that we learned that, that basically this country is not this whitewashed thing that we learned, that this, this country has been a struggle just like as, as it has been all through Europe. And, and so much of the devastation in Africa, in South America, all over the world has been done by one group of people, Western European white people. Think about it. If you want to get an interesting thing, check out some of the, read, a, read the period of time of Leonardo da Vinci in the 1400s and what was going on with all the Italian states and German uh, people and uh, the German uh, uh, royalty and, and the popes and all that. And you can go through a lot of history and you can find out how humanity in so many ways has been so cruel and the people who have been the most greedy and the most voracious are the people from Western Europe. And it's, it's very, but then he, the basic premise of the book is not to make anybody depressed, but to highlight how all of these people in many instances, particularly in this country, have risen above us, how unions were formed, what has happened in the civil rights movement, and all of these things where people, the, the advancements in the civilization in this country or in the society in this country has come from a movement of the people. It didn't come from the government top down. It's always come from the people who have pulled together and said, we're gonna fight this. And it's an amazing book. And don't be surprised if when you start to read a couple of things in the book, you start to, I mean, I read part of it and I had to put it down and, and go read a little bit of the mystery. Now I'm gonna, <laughs> Now I'm, now I'm going back. But I mean, sometimes you have to do that because this is so impactful. And if you, if you look up Howard Zinn, you'll find out that uh, people like Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky and, and, and people like that are, you know, they're all of the same ilk. And they're basically for the people who are, who are the regular folks and the downtrodden. That's who they're for. And you know, that really encompasses most of us. You know, I mean, of the basic general people in this country, they're, the, most of the population is from the middle on down. The people who are up on the top, it's the very tippy top of the pyramid. And, and that's why we all have to be involved. That's why we have to be educated. We have to learn about what's going on. We have to be willing to stand up with the people behind, beside us who, uh, who don't have the voice. When, when the first travel ban was done, I, I just have to say this because this is beautiful. A lawyer friend of mine from Texas, who actually argued in front of the Supreme Court on a case, said it was one of the proudest moments in his life, and he's a year older than me, when 4,000 lawyers all over the country raced to the airports to defend any of the people coming in who were, being, who's, who were being violated by the, this whole Muslim ban thing when the very first one came in. We have to protect, we have people, we, I'm part of, I don't know if you haven't heard about it, you should learn about something called indivisible. Indivisible. We have several chapters in, in our area and one of the things that we're trying to do is to make sure that the undocumented workers in our community who've been there for years, who many of us know, stay under the radar. And our little local police forces do not uh, uh, work with ICE to try to deport these people who not only are working and members of our community, but are paying taxes in this country. You know, see, I hate, I'm sorry about to get on this rant, <laughs> but I have to tell you, there's only one thing that we have in this world and it's each other, you know, and you don't hear that enough from the people from the pulpit. I don't know who they're preaching to or what they believe, but when you get down to it, that's all we have. 
and, and it doesn't make any difference what your background is or your color or whether you can play a high double B flat or whether you're only you know, a middle C kind of guy or lady. It doesn't make any difference. We're all in this together. You know? So with that, I'm going to say thank you, and I enjoyed being with you. <laughs>